Let's look now at patrimonialism and its connection to religion in the way it plays out on the Arabian Peninsula. If you recall what we discussed in the uh, last week when we talked about Egypt in the video 3.6, when we looked at Weber's analysis of order, he said that power is a necessary ingredient to establish order. And he defined power as the ability to compel obedience even against resistance. So that's a necessary condition. But he pointed out that it's more efficient and more convenient if there's no need to actually use force because the, the rules accept the, the, the given order as legitimate and ultimately beneficial. And the ability to find obedience for your orders without the need of having to use force, that's what Weber calls authority or Herrschaft. And here it's, it's useful to, to refer to another uh, concept that uh, Antonio Gramsci developed at the, turn, at the beginning of the last century, which he calls cultural hegemony. And that concept refers to the, the worldview that buttresses this legitimate order, the, the, the worldview that reinforces established power relations and interests. Now, religion in most systems feeds into these existing power relations and can therefore be conceived as part of the cultural hegemony, the, the cultural norms that support an existing distribution of power and interests. Now, I'd like you to remember what we also discussed when we talked about Egypt last week, what Weber, um, Weber's triple classification of authority. Remember, he said that there is power as a necessary ingredient to established order, to force obedience, but authority is the willing submission of the rules into the legitimacy of the order. And Weber says there are three basic ideal types in which authority can be established. There's a bureaucratic rational way of establishing authority based on the logic of distribution of mandates and the qualities of those who, the, the, the ability of, of those who exercise power. Then there's charismatic authority based on the belief and the supernatural uh, inherently personal abilities of the person carrying out uh, power or exercising power. And then there is traditional authority, which in Weber's classification is the, uh, the belief of the rule in the holiness of, an, of a given order and governing structure that has always existed. Order in the system is based not on any intrinsic quality or logical rationale of the command, but simply due to the duty of obedience that the subject owes the Lord due to the longevity of his rule. So it's an authority based not on competence, but on tradition. Now, all of the ruling houses on the Arabian Peninsula explicitly base the legitimacy of the rule and thus the consent of their subjects on such traditional authority of their respective dynasties. It's hard not to be stuck by two observations. One is the anachronistic, if not atavistic, character of these states and the social institutions on which they rely. And secondly, the artificial character of many of these institutions whose claimed authenticity and genuineness is, uh, throws a lot of questions if we, if we look at them. Perhaps another German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, might help us understand this better. He has this concept of a usable past. And what does he mean with a usable past? He says that any political community, both in any individual but also any political groupings of, of individuals, will 
will have a particularly, particular narrative of its own history from which it constructs its identity and which he uses for political aims. And it's something that we, we see quite uh, prominently here in the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Here, These are societies that deliberately construct a particular image of their history and create this artificial connection with a glorified past and the, with the claim that this glorified past has managed to, to survive into the present era almost unchanged. Here we see an image of a local um, man uh, sort of living a, a traditional life. It's an old image and the idea is that it has not changed very much, which to some extent, yes, we do see uh, elements that where, where social life has not changed very much, but as you all are aware, this is a construction. We, the, the life in the uh, Arabian Peninsula has dramatically altered. The living conditions by no means are as they were. And so we are dealing here with a deliberate construction that helps to cement the, the, the legitimacy of these, these rules. And the question is whether that is a, an accurate and usable approach. And in particular, what is conveniently forgotten in this historical narrative is the, uh, is the close symbiosis, not to say dependency, on foreign powers that have, uh, the, the, uh, without whom these, these, these uh, ruling dynasties would not have been able to survive. And uh, not only in the past, but also in the present. And this tension between the, the, the self-image, the deliberate historical narrative of authenticity with the reality of strong dependence on a foreign, infidel world that is generally portrayed in extremely negative terms, that creates a tension in the self-image, in the identity, and ultimately also in the, the, the basis of legitimacy. It's important here now to, to remember that the while well, the, the Saudis establish their order on their own, so it's, they are not a, a creation of foreign powers, and they did manage to fend off the, the attempts by the Ottomans during the, 18th, uh, the, during the 19th century to suppress them, and then in the 20th century reassert themselves autonomously and establish their state, they do enter very, a very close um, dependency, a relationship of dependency with first the British and then later the, uh, the American um, protectors. And that's something that is at odds with the particular interpretation of Wahhabi Islam, which is a very puritanical, if not xenophobic, uh, interpretation of Islam that is strongly stressing the, the, the purity and the, the, the authenticity of that particular grouping. And this tension between the, the dependency on foreign protection and the, the, the ideological base, the religious base of the Saudi uh, state continues. And that is the, one of the tensions that we, we try to explore this week. The claim of these states to have already found the perfect social arrangement, which is closely tied to, to the, the, the religious claim of, how, of you know, having, being in possession of an, of an ideal, perfect uh, law and, 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 and dogma that is, is uh, not in need of, of, of further mod, uh, modification and perfection, that is now being questioned or when we, we look at the very dramatic and rapid change that these societies have undergone. I don't have an image now from the, the, the Gulf states as they looked like 40 or 50 years ago, but so I leave this to your imagination. But these were, remember, these are societies that had not at all changed for the last several centuries until the discovery of oil. So you have people who are literally uh, 
living a very simple nomadic or semi-nomadic life in the desert. And then all of a sudden, within in the span of the last two generations, 40 years, 40, 50 years, you have now extremely modern metropolises springing up. Here we have an image of the marina in Dubai. And this image can compare with any other image of one of the very large cities of this world, of Shanghai, New York, or whatever. And you can imagine that life in a metropolis like this will be very, very different from life in the, in, at the time of the prophet. But here not, you now have a state and a society that claims to be governed by the very same norms and social organizations that existed at the time of the prophet, but they're now living in a modern metropolis that looks like this. The unwillingness to to actually go the full length of, um, of change that is required to achieve a particular process. Let me quote what Al-Azam writes about the clever personality and its particular, um, the challenge that it poses for a society. It says, one of the properties of the clever personality that Dr. Amar enumerates is a constant search for the shortest and fastest route to realize particular goals and aims while avoiding the toil and the effort usually required in overcoming impediments to reach this goal and avoiding using the natural means to attain it because the concern of the clever personality is not the accomplishment of the work in the most complete way but mere success in achieving the goals lest he be called incapable or incompetent. For what matters to him most is that he performed a task in a way that maintains his personal facade. So it's about creating the perception of success rather than achieving success itself. And that's something we see very much in evidence here in the Gulf states where the, the wealth allows them to purchase the paraphernalia of modernity, of uh, modern goods, modern... Um, um, weaponry, what modern consumer goods, modern technology, and actually the wealth also allows them to import the personnel necessary to operate these, but they do not achieve the, the personal qualities and the societal qualities that are necessary to actually make use and make sense of these, um, these uh, elements of foreign produced modernity that are now imported. So we see this very much in evidence now in the, in the Gulf states where as here, you know, very, very advanced weaponry is imported. But as we already discussed, they, when it then came to the liberation of Kuwait, these weaponry, they, they, they were not able to use them very effectively. Uh, we see it in some of these um, uh, very heavily publicized attempts of, you know, you, you have, for example, in, in Abu Dhabi, where there's now a Louvre museum being built right next to it. There's a Guggenheim Abu Dhabi being built. You have uh, the, the Qatar World, uh, uh, World Championships are now coming to Qatar. You have here is an image from a tennis tournament in, in Dubai, where these states now are trying to buy the the almost like trophies, aspects of being part of a successful modern nation, but these are aspects that are simply purchased. They're not domestically produced, they're not domestically maintained, they're not domestically operated. And that will, that gives us an indication of the, 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 the ongoing problems that exist in society, in, the, in these societies that are, and you remember it until 50 years ago, they were very, very, uh, to use a politically incorrect term, backward. And now they have propelled themselves into the first front of the most advanced nations, and that's where they want to be. So they buy these aspects. But it's questionable whether the, these, the societies have, ch have been able to actually make sense of these things. And that's what, what Al-Azam refers to as the clever personality, the inability to accept reality and deal with it, because that would actually require 
to look at the social organization, the social norms that exist, and adapt them to this changed reality of, of life. And that's explicitly something that the, the governing models of these countries don't permit them to do. And this contradiction is something that we will refer to in the last video of this week. And in the next video, we will look at the, uh, the, the rentier economies, the, the particular structure of the economic system that only allows them to pursue this uh, consumerist approach to modernization.